from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Lisa Abram was in for Jonathan Farrow. A bit of a melt up. Hard to give any narrative to this because yields are up as well and the job owning continues. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. We begin with the big issue, a higher bar for the bear market rally. This recent uh, bear market rally. As much as we want to think that this bear market is over. It's going to remain volatile. The release of the CPI report. Everyone's been looking for this. You can see the jubilation. This rally makes a lot of sense. The rally can certainly continue in the short run, at least up to 4,100. 4,000 to 4,150 was the range we, we targeted on the S&P 500. What we can do is we can take advantage of some strategic positioning. There's still headwinds on earnings, still headwinds from valuations. It's still a bear market, so it can rip you apart. Once we get up to 4100 we think that's where things start to get more challenging we have to be tactical and forward looking and then it's a question of where do you go from there we'll just have to wait and see how it goes a lot of bearishness and yet the market's up yet again joining us now to discuss and explain what their view is stock gens subhadra japa and morgan stanley's jim karen subhadra from your perspective we keep hearing fed officials jaw boning down this market is there essentially a cap that they're trying to put on how high these uh these stocks can go yeah absolutely i mean you you, you get into this vicious cycle where you know if the fed starts to pull back or if we get strong uh you know data um you know, CPI ten, it was a little bit lower than expected. Anytime you see an inflection point in the data, you, you're seeing this sort of, of rally in risky assets. You're seeing financial conditions start to ease. We're seeing mortgage rates come off quite meaningfully uh, in the last uh, you know, week or so. So under these circumstances, you, you tend to see uh, risk taking coming back into the market. So what the message is from the Fed is that they're steady. They want to stay the course on, on rate hikes. They want to keep you know, policy tight for the for the rest remainder of next year um, until inflation starts to come down. So they've been sort of steadfastly holding on to that sort of messaging on inflation, as well as you know, uh, making sure that we don't get into this vicious cycle where financial conditions ease very quickly, and then they're going to have to do more by way of hikes to curb uh, the inflationary pressures in the market. Jim, do you buy into this bear market rally at all? Or are you basically saying that this is just a matter of time and it feels very technical? Yeah, well, thank you for having me on your show. And I, I follow Sabarja's work very closely, and, and, and she does very good work. And I think she nailed it. Look, it's really about financial conditions. So if I, if I take a step back and I think about is the Fed happy or are they worried about the most recent CPI number showing that inflation has come down? I think they're happy that that's happened. But now to get to the point here, uh, what that had or what that actually created was a, a significant easing in financial conditions as equity prices rallied quite a bit. Uh, the dollar fell and credit spreads narrowed. So that is longer term inflationary when financial conditions ease. And that means it's going to undo a lot of the work that the Fed is trying to do to push inflation lower. So what that ultimately tells me is that the Fed is trying to push inflation lower through the financial assets channel. So the fact that equities or riskier assets have started to rally I would be a little bit worried about that because a rally in these risky assets today is really a bet that the Fed is going to fail in terms of their policy actions. So the, the rally that we've seen to me seems more like a correction, as Mike Wilson was saying, up to maybe that 44,000, 4150 level as, as, as he targets it in, in the S&P. But ultimately, I think that the Fed, this just means that the Fed has more room and they feel emboldened to actually even be more aggressive and hike rates more as long as they have the cushion of financial asset prices to do it, because their number one mission is to bring that inflation rate down towards target. As we talk, it sounds complicated, especially for people who are like, well, you know, if the company is doing well, we can buy the stock and it should do better. And people saying, actually, it has nothing to do with them. It has to do with central bank planning the team at City blaming the volatility that we've seen this year and QT consequences, writing, quote, this year's market gyrations are better explained in terms of central bank liquidity additions and, and subtractions than in terms of shifts in their language. It is likely to take more than just words to create a durable rally in risk assets. 
Subhadra, when you talk about how words come out and try to combat a market, we're also looking at the balance sheet, the liquidity aspect. And it has come down uh, perhaps uh, close to 400, 300 to 400 billion dollars since the peak earlier this year. How much is that going to be a driving factor in some of the volatility that we see perhaps in the first quarter of next year? Yeah, I mean, there's already been a big driving factor of the volatility in the market over the last, I would say, even uh, beyond uh, over a year now, when the Fed started tapering asset purchases last September, you started seeing liquidity conditions start to deteriorate. And the Fed is going to, again, continue to, ru to run down its balance sheet. We're expecting them to continue to, to run off their balance sheet uh, well into next year and, and beyond, because, yes, Liquidity conditions have deteriorated, but the market functioning is broadly okay. We are seeing some choppy price action in, in auctions. You're starting to see some pressure uh, in, in the bond market from, uh, you know, bond investors stepping away on the demand side of the equation. Uh, but broadly speaking, I think that the Fed is going to try to use every channel it can to tighten financial conditions. One way to do it is by running off their balance sheet. And this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Now you have the U.K. as well as uh, Europe that are going to start to engage in quantitative tightening. So broadly speaking, I think balance sheets globally are going to start to continue to, to, to run off. And that's going to keep some, uh, some pressure on bond yields. Jim, from your perspective, how much are you actually just hoarding cash continually, avoiding any potential rallies and just basically hunkering down for something that seems a little bit more clear cut? Yeah, I think that's a good point from an investment perspective. The front end offers quite a bit of value. So whether we're talking cash, it's just cash or cash in money markets or, or short term uh, high quality fixed income assets. I think that's a big part of it. I think right now that's actually a very, very good diversifier. You are getting paid nice yields at this point to have that money in cash or cash like equivalents or cash like instruments. And I think this is a good offset. So when we think about returns and risk adjustment, returns. We think that having an overweight towards the front end. So for me, the, the optimal duration is somewhere around a three-year duration for a fixed income portfolio. But a lot of that, and that's an average level, uh, a lot of that is going to be based in some of these shorter term uh, financial assets, money markets around one and even even two-year maturities. And I'll, I'll, I'll hedge that a little bit by owning some things a little bit longer so that the average duration gets to about three years. But I think that this is where we need to be right now because there's a lot of uncertainty as to how high the Fed may actually even hike interest rates, you know, probably around the 5% terminal level is what I think. But that's, um, but so between now and say the first quarter, I think that's going to be a pretty good diversifier. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jim, because what we saw yesterday from the Fed's Jim Bullard of St. Louis, he really set the tone, basically slapping a five handle on his terminal rate outlook. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari also taking the hawkish cue. We are all united in our commitment to getting inflation back down to our 2% target. It's an open question of how far we are going to have to go with interest rates to bring that demand down into balance. We have raised interest rates a lot this year, so there's a lot of tightening in the pipeline. We have not felt the full effects yet, and yet inflation is still very high. Boston Fed President Susan Collins, the latest to pour cold water on any hopes of a dovish shift, saying, quote, the latest data have not reduced my sense of what sufficiently restrictive may mean, nor my resolve. This will require additional increases in the federal funds rate following by, followed by a period of holding rates. Bloomberg's Michael McKee joining us now for more, basically saying, if you guys are reading into that CPI report, don't. Except they are. <laughs> and that's the funny thing. Uh, the markets and the Fed don't seem to see eye to eye over the course of 2023. You talked about Jim Bullard yesterday. He said yields higher, but yet look what really happened. Uh, the terminal rate that he is projecting, uh, the market pushed it up, but not to even where it was last week. So the market's not really buying the idea that they're going to go much beyond 5%. They did move it out to May, but then they think that we're going to see cuts. And you can see that in the dot plot. Now, the market, and we talked about this yesterday, Lisa, the market can reprice every day, whereas the Fed does its dot plots uh, every other meeting. So it was September when they said this, but you can see the green line there. That's where the Fed thought in September that uh, we would be in terms of rates. And the red line is where the market thinks now 
we are going to be in the market. Thinks they're going to come down significantly. Those are overnight index swaps matched against uh, the Fed's path. So uh, the Fed is still trying to push up rates and push up the psychology. You take a look here. Uh, my friend Jim Karen mentioning the idea of uh, the Fed failing, and I know you were uh, big on this earlier today, Lisa. This is the the uh, three month curve out to eighteen months, and uh, Jay Powell's favorite curve. He said earlier this year that if it inverts, it means the Fed's going to cut rates. Well, it inverted yesterday. It's come uh, back to about zero this morning. But does that mean the Fed's going to cut rates? Well, I think basically what we're seeing with all these things is Fed's going to have to do a lot more work to keep the markets on side. Mike McKee, great work. As always, Subhadra Japa, Jim Karen, both still with us. Jim was mentioning about that terminal rate. Subhadra, do you feel like the market has accurately priced a terminal rate of 5% by the Federal Reserve, followed by rate cuts that the Fed said isn't going to happen next year? Or do you think that the risk really is to the upside? So I agree with Jim. I think the terminal Fed funds rate for now at least looks like it's going to be around 5% or 5 and, and 5 and a quarter. But what our view for next year is that once they get to that terminal Fed funds rate, they're going to keep rates steady for the remainder of 2023, uh, even if you start seeing cracks appear in some of the data as well as, uh, you know, the curve continuing to invert because of the fact that they want to see inflation start to move down steadily lower. The Fed has 3.1% core PCE penciled in for next year. That's still above its 2% uh, you know, target uh, for inflation. So for the most part, I think they're going to move rates to 5 to 5 and a quarter percent. They know that policy works with long and variable labs, lags. So they're probably going to keep policy steady for the remainder of next year and then evaluate if there is a meaningful slowdown in the economy or, or a recession, then they might uh, think about uh, you know, changing course if they see a trajectory towards lower inflation. Subhaj Rajapa, Jim Karen, both of you are sticking with us, joining us now with a look at the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Abby. Hey, Lisa. Well, it turns out that there's at least one discretionary item that is immune to inflation sneakers. We have Foot Locker popping sharply higher on a very strong quarter, much better than expected. They beat estimates, plus the holiday outlook, much better than feared. But it's not just Foot Locker. It's so interesting because we have all these conflicting reports out of retailers. The Gap also put up a strong quarter, a sales beat that shows that the clothing retailer perhaps is beginning to see an improvement. Lots of price targets raised on the street. Ross Stars stores the discounting uh, retailer up 16.2 percent. They beat third quarter estimates. They raised their full year forecast on the back of sales momentum. Now applied materials going to the technology space, the semi-cap equipment company. So basically a tell on the chip industry. They make the machines that make the chips up nearly 4 percent after they forecast sales for the current quarter that topped estimates. It seems that supply chain improvements are helping uh, to offset economic slowdown. And then Finally, the economic slowdown that we're seeing. And then finally, Palo Alto Networks, the cybersecurity company, Lisa, that stock is also sharply higher. They put up a very strong quarter, lots of metrics right across the board. Importantly, Billings, a look forward beat that stock really sharply higher. Abby, thank you so much. It's showing really the distinction between uh, the haves and the have nots within the software and tech space rather than just casting them all aside. Coming up, fiscal policy threatening to undermine the central bank fight against inflation. In the short term, the stance of fiscal policy is important. Fiscal policy needs to be temporary, targeted, and tailored. That's my triple T for you. That conversation is still ahead. From New York, this is Bloomberg. A mess this country is in. We've had 12 years of Conservative government, 12 weeks of utter chaos, and it is ordinary working people and businesses that are paying the price uh, for that volatility, that chaos that we've seen in recent weeks. Fiscal turmoil across the Atlantic, the UK unveiling a new budget plan amid a gloomier economic forecast. All over in the United States, a divided Congress hangs the fate of the U.S. fiscal policy imbalance. Let's bring in the team. Emily Wilkins down in Washington, Guy Johnson in London. Uh, Emily, I want to start with you. Some leadership changes over in the House. Also questions around the Senate. How much are we looking at a situation where there will not be the fiscal response or the ability to get anything done? 
I think we're looking at a very real situation of that happening. I mean, at this point, it's not just that you're going to have a divided government where Republicans control the House and Democrats control the Senate and White House, but you also have very, very narrow margins to work with in both chambers, and that's going to make it very difficult for party leaders to try and navigate, keep all of their members on board while being able to actually get things through. Now, we do have to should point out at least that we have seen divided government work before. When COVID happened, we did see both Democrats and Republicans Republicans come together, pass funding. We've seen similar bipartisan support on issues like Ukraine, but certainly there are really big questions right now on what's going to happen next year when the debt ceiling needs to be raised and Congress needs to have that debate, as well as what's going to happen with just basic bills to fund the government. Is this going to mean a government shutdown? I think those are all things that we're going to be watching for very closely in the next coming year. Guy, you're probably listening to Emily and you listen to the debate over in the U.S. and you think, hold my beer. <laughs> Take a listen to what we're dealing yeah. with. I mean, how has the fallout been from the prospect of some fiscal austerity that we heard yesterday paired with the inflationary outlook and the discussion from Catherine Mann at the Bank of England today over at that European confab? In, in some ways, the fiscal event yesterday, the awesome statement yesterday, Lisa, was designed to reduce the chaos that we're seeing on the fiscal front. Um, but I think you've got to sift through the tea leaves uh, to kind of figure out exactly what is happening here. This is a heavily backloaded package that was delivered uh, by the UK. All of the pain is going to come... Well, not all of the pain. The bulk of the pain is going to be coming in the second half uh, of the, uh, the forecast window after the next 2024 election. Uh, and actually, the front end uh, is significantly easier on the consumer. And that's going to be a big problem for the Bank of England. Uh, so while there is significant pain coming... The bulk of it comes later. The Bank of England potentially, therefore, is going to have to be more restrictive in the way that it approaches things. Uh, so I still think that we haven't quite got through the chaos yet. Um, the, the, the interplay between monetary and fiscal policy, I, I think, is yet to completely click. Uh, and I think Catherine Mann certainly talking about that, uh, I think, from the Bank of England's point of view, uh, yesterday is going to have an effect. Clearly, their forecasts are going to be wrong over at the Bank of England uh, because they've just put them out before this fiscal event. But nevertheless... I think the Bank of England probably takes the message from yesterday's fiscal event that it is going to have to do more. Great work, uh, Guy Johnson, Emily Wilkins, both of you. Thank you so much. Guy Johnson putting it really well there, talking about how we haven't seen it play out, the interplay of fiscal and monetary policy. Subhadra Japa, Jim Karen, both back with, with us. Subhadra, when you game out what's to come, how much do you think about the lack of a fiscal response, even as monetary policy uh, makers really pull back, really become more restrictive? So on the fiscal side, we already have a lot of fiscal spending that was passed, right? The infrastructure uh, deal as well as the Inflation Reduction Act uh, are both going to be, uh, you know, uh, looking towards more fiscal spending. You might see the, the Republicans, like Emily was pointing out, pull back on some of the, the, uh, the expenditures. Um, to me, what really I'm concerned about is the debt ceiling. I mean, we have a divided Congress, and there's going to be perhaps another showdown that we should be looking uh, towards um, in the next uh, you know, few months on the debt ceiling. So uh, there's definitely a, a, a lot of, um, of pushback that you're going to see from Republicans on the fiscal spending side, but a lot of the bigger fiscal spending has already been passed. So we'll have to see what else they can do to pull back on, on spending. Jim, from your perspective, how do you game this out, right? How do you figure out how to price in the lack of a fiscal response, the potential for there to be some sort of additional policy accident? So I think this is a very important point, and context is going to matter here a lot. So let's go back in time here and go to the global financial crisis 2008. We had unconventional monetary policy as a result of that. Then we get the pandemic, and then we all of a sudden have unconventional fiscal policy, which was really deficit spending, spending out of debt, issuing debt and, and spending money. Now that interest rates are higher, governments don't have a free ride at this anymore. It costs money to actually deficit spend or spend money out of debt. So what's happening today is there has been a lot of spending. There needs to be a contraction of fiscal policy. That's already happening in the U.S. Fiscal policy is already tightening just by virtue of the fact that there's less fiscal spending that's going through right now. The key for us in terms of gaming this out into the future is what kind of fiscal stimulus do we get? And this is really a supply-side economics question, meaning that if we want to control inflation and have higher productivity and better growth, meaning high, you know, good growth with low inflation, what you need to see is 
tax policy, incentives for capbacks, incentives for business investment, regulatory changes, things that can actually increase the productive capacity of corporations to make supply meet demand. Right now, what monetary policy is doing is just crushing demand to bring down prices. We need to increase supply and bring down prices, but also increase growth. And that's a supply side dose of economics. That's what fiscal policy can do. Monetary policy only moves demand. Fiscal policy can change the supply side of the equation. And we have a supply problem, whether it's labor supply or good supply or whatever the case may be, we need to address a supply problem with a supply solution. So fiscal policy is going to be very important going forward. Step one, though, is to rein in that spending. That's what's happening. That's what that's what the, that's what the UK is doing. That's what the US is doing. The next step, the critical next step, is not to do deficit spending with fiscal policy, but to do more investment where we get growth, but we don't necessarily increase the debt because we have high growth to pay off, you know, raise revenues through taxes and things like that. Jim, just real quick here, when do you think we can actually look at the economy and say we are no longer seeing the effects of the fiscal stimulus that was passed two years ago and a year ago? So I, I think it's going to be probably in about another year. Right now, we're seeing the tail off of that fiscal spending. Right, The U.S. is in fiscal contraction right now by virtue of the fact that we're spending less money now than what we did during the pandemic. So ultimately, that there is going to be a rebound to this at some point in the future. But I still think that we're going to be feeling this for probably another 12 to 18 months. Which complicates the issue in terms of really mm -hmm. understanding that interplay of the fiscal and the monetary policy. Thank you so much. Subhadra Rajapa, Jim Karen, have a wonderful weekend. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Crossmark's Bob Dole looking for a pause in higher yields to offer some relief. That conversation around the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abram. What's in for Jonathan Farrell? Let's take a look at what's going on. You're getting a little bit of a lift, trying to end the week with a full rally for the week. Up eight tenths of a percent on the S&P, on the NASDAQ. Up a bit more, up more than 1%. Can't really explain this by the yield picture, because you're seeing sort of a bit of an increase in yields. It's basically meandering around. Two-year yield up 4.47%, well off the highs that we've been seeing. Ten-year yield also up just slightly a basis point, 3.78%. Uh, Thirty-year also up, all up, and you're still getting Getting bearish or hawkish discussions from the Fed. It doesn't seem to be making a difference. Time now for the morning calls. A look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, Credit Suisse downgrading HP to neutral, expecting margins to remain pressured by weakening consumer sentiment. Next up, UBS upgrading Conagra to buy, saying the company is likely in the early stages of a positive revision cycle. And finally, Gordon Haskett upgrading raw stores to buy, highlighting the strengthening demand for off-price retailers, a theme that we have been seeing across a number of different uh, retailers. Crossmarks, Bob Dole seeing too many question marks for a sustainable equity rally. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abram. What's in for Jonathan Farrow as Grinder rings the opening bell. I'm in New York Stock Exchange. We are looking at a lift to markets right now. The S&P futures up nine tenths of a percent. NASDAQ futures up more than a percent. Basically, try to come up with a narrative today. I can't. Good luck. Have a good time doing so. You're seeing yields up a little bit. You're getting that hawkish speak, not necessarily creating any sort of a clear cut narrative after a week of tumult, after a week where I think we're going to probably end up gaining by the end. Meanwhile, we are looking at retailers after a slew of uh, earnings that have largely come out better than expected with a few pitfalls. Uh, right now, parsing through all of that, including Foot Locker providing resilient demand. Abigail Doolittle joining now. Abby. Yeah, well, this week has really been very interesting in terms of retail. It started off with a bit bullish pop with Walmart and then Target, not so much. Now we've had a lot of discretionary retailers that are doing quite well. You just mentioned Foot Locker. It seems that folks are willing to pay up for their sneakers despite the inflationary pressures, which Kevin Kelly of Kelly ETFs just wrote in saying that suggests we're not in 
in a recession. Maybe so. They beat and they also raised their holiday outlook, or at least it's better than feared. Ross stores, the discounter, uh, really doing quite well. The stock and the company, the stock is up 17%, and that is an actual lift. There's not a lot of a short interest there. They beat, they raise. It seems as though sales momentum uh, is going well. On the other hand, if you go into some of the more luxury items, for a lack of a better way to put it, Williams Sonoma down 10.6%. Uh, they are not reiterating or updating their outlook. It suggests that they have little to no visibility going forward. Farfetch up, or excuse me, down 5.9%. Soft results and reduced guidance there. So again, mixed results. It seems to be company by company. But one thing that we do have is discretionary, the valuation coming in, similar to consumer staples. If you take a look at consumer staple, does consumer discretionary uh, minus the uh, PE of the consumer staple space in blue there, you see it coming down, coming down, coming down. So that uh, tells you that folks, that investors are concerned that this discretionary spending, that some of the pockets of weakness that we're seeing, it's not worth paying up for. And then finally, though, there is maybe a little bit of hope here, Lisa. If you take a look at these, this chart that we are uh, looking at, uh, this is earnings for combined group of discretionary retailers uh, right now, perhaps troughing somewhere around $23 to $24 next year in the first quarter and the second quarter. It's expected to go up to uh, $26, even $32 uh, for that quarter for that batch of retailers. The Fed's probably the wild card. Lots of folks out there thinking that their hiking cycle is done. If so, that probably helps retailers. If not, and I'm not sure we've really heard that from the Fed, maybe there's a little bit more pain to go. Let's see. Avi, thank you so much. A great job parsing through uh, sort of the strength and the weakness and hard to get a consistent narrative there. A roller coaster year, meanwhile, for big tech, keeping the NASDAQ 100 almost 30 percent below its record high. Kaylee Lyons is here with more. Kaylee. Lisa, the date of that last record high, November 19th, 2021. So it has been almost exactly a year that we haven't reached a new all-time high on that index. Of course, big tech stocks, which make up the bulk of that benchmark, underperforming the broader market this year as we have seen interest rates rising. Just take a look at the two-year yield, up about 400 basis points from where we were a year ago. That is just absolutely astounding and helps explain why these higher multiple stocks are having a lot higher difficulty uh, over the last 12 months. In fact, when you think about how far away last November 19th is, that was 249 trading days ago. So this makes the longest stretch without a record high since the dot-com era and actually the third longest ever. It took the index more than 15 years or 3,925 trading days to recover from the dot-com crash and 416 to rebound from the crash of 1987. So we're not quite at those extremes yet, but when you take a look at the technical perspective, this index has been below its 200 DMA for 159 days. So if it goes another 10 trading days under that level, it will also be the longest period since the dot-com bubble. As for the individual stocks that have been helping create that drag, just five names have contributed to half of the index's losses over the last year. Amazon, about 12% of it. Meta and Microsoft, roughly 10% each. Those three stocks collectively are worth $2.3 trillion less than they were a year ago. And of course, Tesla, NVIDIA creating some big point drags as well. But it has been brutal for these heavyweight names, Lisa. Kaylee Lines, thank you so much. And there's also a question about how much they can rally going forward. Crossmarks Bob Dahl seeing more room for this bear market uh, bear rally to run writing quote while a further year end rally is possible conditions for a sustained upturn in stocks is not likely to develop until there's more visibility on inflation and earnings a necessary condition for a risk on phase in stocks is for bond markets to stay calm. Bob I'm pleased to say joining us now Bob looking for some sort of calm amid the turmoil will it require uh, some sort of peaking out in inflation that we have not yet seen, but maybe are beginning to see at this point? To get a sustained rally, Lisa, I think that's uh, the correct answer. Look, we've had a nice rally off that 35, 3600 uh, S&P 500, and the bond market has generally been calm and rallying during that period. Uh, and that's enabled stocks to get out of that horrible funk it was in and do better. There could be more in the fourth quarter year end rally. I don't think we uh, exceed the 200-day uh, moving average uh, by much, if at all, which doesn't leave a whole lot of upside from here. So I just see a lot of churning until we get more clarity on the Fed and inflation and interest rates and all the things you've been talking about. In the meantime, how do you parse through the divergence? BlackRock's Kate Moore weighing in yesterday on just this issue. Uh, take a listen. 
Well, I think, you know, the sentiment, the positioning played a big part in the stock reaction. Uh, and I think that's going to be really in play through the next couple months. And as we report fourth quarter in the beginning of next year, I don't think investors are willing to jump in wholesale at this point until they have a sense for where the terminal rate is going to be and what the overall impact on, on multiples will be. So, uh, Bob, very much echoing some of what you were saying, looking for that stability in the bond market. In the meantime, though, are there pockets of equities that you see attractive, particularly as some of these left for dead names perhaps perform a slight bit better than expected? Yeah, in general, as you know, third quarter earnings were less bad than feared. And some of the pockets have done better. You just highlighted one. Look, the retail numbers, I know they weren't great. They were mixed, but... Uh, there were a lot of positive surprises in the death of the consumer that so many people have been talking about. Not really. Look at retail sales. So I think picking over some of, some of that area, uh, some of the tech stocks that have gotten uh, hit hard, probably good for a trade. I don't know about an investment. Uh, I think still the uh, HMOs have had a pullback. I, I suspect they're not finished in this uh, uh, run that we're uh, enjoying here at your end. So how much are you going into retail at this point? Not a whole lot, uh, you know, very selective on names, own some uh, Walmart, own, uh, own some Macy's, um, not a whole lot more than that. But, uh, you know, there's some names I wish I had owned these last week or two. How much do you have to get scale, though? How much can you be a stock picker at a moment when it, everything is being dominated by macro trends and things can shift on a dime based on that? Yeah, great question. I think you have to you have to be cognizant of the macro. But of course, there are winners and losers. Retail is a perfect example. Uh, what's the macro for the consumer? We can debate that. But even within that, there are winners and there are losers. My attitude has been in this market as a portfolio manager, Lisa, to be more reactive than usual. In other words, when there are a lot of big down days in a row, a lot of red on the screen, buy a few stocks. Conversely, when we got a lot of green, sell a few stocks. I think leaning against the wind is sentiment rolls from one end of the boat to the other so very quickly in this uncertain period. How do you how do you remain that nimble at a time when a lot of people talk about strained liquidity and basic benchmark markets like treasuries? Well, there, there's a, there's more liquidity out there, particularly for smaller investors than one might think. I don't think that is a big deal. And so uh, uh, picking your price points uh, when you get them uh, can be great uh, on the buy and the sell side when volatility is so high. Use volatility to your advantage. Don't be scared by it. What about the wild ride that you see in tech? Can you have the same kind of momentum trade that you're talking about to capture dollars uh, to lean against sentiment? Or is that a different story? I, I, tech is, has been very difficult, as we know, and the trades can be vicious, but are often very short-lived. Uh, and that's the truth for bear market rallies in general, a, a, as you know. So I think uh, picking them off, is a, a, you've got to be very careful, wait for your price. You, you, you don't have to get ahead of the curve on these things. I'm, I'm not sure their leadership underperformance is over yet. Do you have a sense, Bob, of how much of the portfolio should be active, like you said, on a day-to-day, -day, taking advantage of, of big moves one way or another, and how much should be sort of uh, theory-driven that, you know, inflation is going to roll over next year, that the Fed is going to keep rates at 5 percent perhaps for uh, at least 9 to 12 months before reassessing all of these kinds of macro drivers to sort of have a permanent longer view look? How do you distribute that? Yeah, I know I sounded like a trader with the last few answers. <laughs> I, I'm just talking about trading around core positions, not wholesale in and out. And I think you hit some of the key issues. Even if we are going to solve inflation, it's not going to be today or tomorrow. It's going to take some time. If the Fed really wants 2% inflation, we got a long way to go. Um, if they're going to do a pause after December and wait and see what impact the most vicious rise in interest rates in uh, Fed history has been, which might be smart of them to see what impact it's had. Um, we're probably going to have some earnings disappointments out there. Uh, fourth quarter earnings, I think, are going to be dicey again, and some will kitchen sink uh, and, and look for better things in 23. Bob, a lot of people, when I look at the outlooks for next year, talk about a new bond bull market. Essentially, we've had the worst year on record for treasuries, at least in modern history. Next year will be a great one because the Fed is committed to bringing inflation under control and will achieve their goal. Do you agree? I mean, do you think that it's going to be just a bang up awesome year for uh, duration? I think duration will win next year, but I'm not sure uh, I'm re ready to say, you know, it's a, a brand spanking new uh, bull market. And we're going straight up. Our view is 
when 10-year Treasury yields, as I've done three or four times, get above 4%, start nibbling. You don't have to be a hero here. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to end up with uh, uh, some huge um, move in bonds and much lower yields next year. We're still going to have an underlying inflation issue as the year uh, progresses. Bob Dahl, thank you so much for your time. Have a great weekend. Uh, let's take a look at some of that trading activity that Bob was talking about. Back with us is Abigail Doolittle. Abby. Hey, Lisa. Well, let's take a look at the crypto space because it seems as though there's a a little bit of a hopeful stabilization here and this of course a week after chapter 11 for uh, FTX and the resignation of SBF uh, there is actually now we're seeing a decline earlier we had been looking at big uh, big uh, big gains so this speaks to the volatility in the price action here for this crypto space that it continues uh, as Bitcoin itself is basically fluttering between gains and losses uh, but there is evidence that some of these investors are decentralizing on blockchain that's open to the public that had been adding hope earlier not so much. Let's see how the day plays on. As for some other movers on the day, let's take a look at what's working. AMD and some of the other chips gaining. Actually, NVIDIA is uh, up just slightly. So we're seeing some of the big gainers in the pre-market action, Lisa, coming back in. Tesla, in fact, earlier had been up 1%, but it seems that it is back down, perhaps as some investors are wondering uh, what the toll of Twitter will be on Elon Musk and his role at Tesla. Carnival Corp, there we have the gains continuing up 2% yesterday. The cruise operators had been in sharp after uh, Norwegian was downgraded, plus Carnival uh, just did a big debt, convertible debt offering. And then finally, uh, one reliable group of gainers, the gain sticking from the pre-market to now, Lisa, that of course is the meme stocks, AMC of 4%. And apparently Disney's Black Panther is expected to do very well at the box office again this weekend. After speaking with Bob Dahl, I wonder how much is just day trading of people trying to lean against the recent moves. Abigail, thank you so much. Coming up, the headwinds continuing to pile up for big tech, mass layoffs, adding to the pain. That conversation coming up with Nuveen's Sarah Malik. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lise Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Peter Orzak, CEO of Lazard Financial Advisory. That conversation at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Twitter is a very resilient platform. Elon hasn't done anything to give comfort and confidence in Twitter, but... Um, it's still a very important platform on a global basis. So the question is how relevant it will be. Uh, that's a big question. Whether it's going to be around, that's not such a big question. Social media platforms facing the threat of increasing government intervention. Twitter, the latest under the microscope. A group of Democratic senators asking the FTC to look into Elon Musk's leadership, writing, quote, Musk has taken alarming steps that have undermined the integrity and safety of the platform. Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg Tech co-anchor, joining us for now. What's the latest, Ed? What are we waiting for to find out just how much damage is being done to the social media company? Yeah, a lot of the concern from lawmakers and, and kind of the push to have FTC screen is about personnel, right? That Twitter very quickly has gone from a team of 7,500 people to then 3,500 after layoffs. And as we've reported overnight, Musk offered the opportunity to those staff remaining to remain if they agreed to his new workplace culture. And many in their hundreds decided that they would rather leave. The worry is that those that have left include people that are responsible for content moderation, for people that are responsible for safety and integrity on the platform. Um, and lawmakers are basically pushing to give the FTC some teeth in policing Twitter, which already has a 2011 agreement with the agency to have minimum standards when it comes to the data protection of its users. I thought, Lo, thank you so much. Honestly, we'll be tracking this throughout the day and I'm trying to understand really what the fate of the company is. Novi and Sarah Malik, Malik uh, seeing a long list of headwinds into next year, writing, quote, 2023 earnings estimates are not anchored in reality. We are concerned about future earnings growth, given cost pressures, high margins, strong dollar, uh, dollar and demand destruction from higher rates. Syra uh, joins us now. That was talking more generally, not specifically about Twitter, which is now a private company. But before we get into some of the public ones, that I know that you focus on very much. Sarah, how, how do you really view the story uh, of a company that was just the subject of a $44 billion leveraged buyout with a lot of investors behind that, now suddenly with question marks existential about its existence? 
Well, I think, you know, Twitter had struggled for a long time. It was a lagging technology stock while it was public with a business model that probably strategically hadn't gone to its potential. And so the question is now, how are we going to get it to what its potential is? You know, it's not clear now that it's a private company. And this moves me to the big mega cap tech companies with the NASDAQ down as significantly as it, as it is. Should we be taking a look at these? A lot of their models are proving to be more cyclical than initially perceived due to their advertising businesses. I think Twitter's in that bucket. And a lot of them have been spending pretty heavily into a downturn. And so until these businesses adjust their spending to reflect the cyclicality of their models, I think they're going to struggle. So in technology, we like software companies like Palo Alto Networks and ServiceNow, companies with strong backlogs and some visibility into their future and more structural tailwinds to grow. And we're certainly seeing other people bid that up today, Sarah. I do wonder, though, if there's a, a bigger concern around social media companies in general. Meta is another one, Facebook, Wall Street Journal reporting uh, that Congress is looking into uh, after or that they actually reported that they fined and fired certain employees for accepting bribes to potentially uh, interfere with certain accounts. How much is there going to be such increased scrutiny that it's hard to really put any money behind a social media company right now. I agree with you. Regulations are another headwind. So beyond the cyclicality that many of these companies rely on with advertising, we also have to think about what are the macro implications of regulations. As a fundamental investor, those are hard to predict, and it's hard to get that into the valuation. So again, that's why we're avoiding the ones that have heavy regulatory scrutiny, because it's a bit of a black box, and cyclical advertising businesses, on top of the fact that they continue to spend into this downturn, they need to readjust their business models before they become attractive from a valuation point of view again. Given this Sort of idiosyncratic nature of specific tech names. How much have you moved away from indexes and really toward a very different type of bucketed investing strategy than you've had over the past 10 years? That's a good point. As a growth investor for the past 10 years, you actually had to have they tended to have lower active share because you had to own those top index na index names at an overweight in order to beat the benchmark. I think today's a growth in tech investor is different. You need to be looking at areas that are resilient, not only software companies, but growth areas that are more reasonably priced, like healthcare. A company we like is Zimmer Biomed, which has a nice secular tailwind for demographics. Orthopedic procedures should be returning to normal post-COVID. Revenue growth margin expansion, expansion and putting up clean numbers. So we're looking outside of mega cap tech, which tends to dominate the benchmark, into other areas that will differentiate from the differentiate you from the benchmark. Well, I was asking this to, to Bob Dahl, who was talking about similar types of trades and similar types of single stocks uh, that he is looking Looking at how do you do that in scale, given that you have a significant portfolio that you have to manage? I think with you know with over a trillion dollars in assets across all of our different asset classes, you know, we're longer term investors. We're looking for those companies that can be resilient to and through a cycle. So first of all, pricing power for next year. That's going to be key with margins at peak levels, earnings at risk, earnings still showing growth for next year. When you look at consensus, as we probably go into recession, who has the pricing power to continue to overcome the input costs that they're dealing with? Another area long-term you can own is companies that grow their dividends. So um, a resilient company like Linda, it's an industrial gas business, less sensitive um, to the economy. Uh, it beat and raised on the last quarter. It tends to give conservative guidance and a 1.5% dividend yield. So you get some income protection. I want to own companies that I can own for years. I think it's challenging to continue to market time. You, you see even these bear market rallies that are pretty extreme when the fundamentals aren't necessarily matching it. So if you're trying to time the market, I think you can't get in and out at the right time. How much consolidation are you expecting among the strongest players, especially given the divergence in terms of pricing power next year? I think that consolidation will continue to be a theme in certain sectors as the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker. But we also need to think about interest rates and how are you going to accomplish that consolidation. Um, you know, debt is a lot more expensive now, so m and I think, a lot more selective. But as we go through these periods where balance sheets are going to be questioned and uh, tested, uh, if you can't survive, I think you will end up becoming an, an acquired company. Do you think that retail is going to see a lot more in terms of acquisitions? I think retail will continue, continue to consolidate because of the long-term trend of digital over brick and mortar. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is the consumer has been very resilient through the cycle. We are seeing them start to dip into their savings rates in order to keep spending. But the, the answer is that they do keep spending and they still have a lot of savings. So between the consumer and employment, that's why, you know, if you go to the Fed and think about how long they could continue to raise rates, we have a strong consumer, strong employment, a reasonably strong economy, and inflation that's still near all-time highs. That's why our view is that we have slower for longer rate hikes, 50 basis points in December, but continued rate hikes into early, perhaps mid-2023.
Sarah Malik, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Great insights as always. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. In markets, a bit of a lift. I say a bit up four tenths of a percent, trying to eke out a weekly gain on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. Time now for the trading diary here. Uh, but before we get there, let's take a look at what's going on. You are seeing a lift, gaining a little bit, up about a half a percent, both in the NASDAQ and the S&P. A little bit of a lift to yields, too, although I stress little, not exactly dramatic, especially seems, uh, the moves that we've been seeing recently. Up three tenths of the percent, uh, three tenths, uh, three basis points, excuse me, on the 10-year, 3.79 percent a lift across the board. Let's take a look at what you should be watching this week, or next week in particular. Existing home sales coming right now at the top of the hour. President Biden meeting with business leaders at 1.30 Eastern. The Fed speak picking back up over the weekend with Bostic on Saturday into the next week. Mester, Bullard and George all on deck for Tuesday. And finally, Fed Minutes coming out on Wednesday with U.S. markets closed on Thanksgiving for uh, the, on Thursday for the Thanksgiving holiday. This was Countdown to the Open. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. This is Bloomberg.